Yeah, it is on. Hey everyone, welcome to the forest. Uh, this is not your typical high school lab, is it? Uh, we've talked a lot about the field of science and it being something that's trying to explain the world through experiment and observation and data. And today's topic is looking at biology, specifically ecology. We want to look at how science can try to figure out patterns in nature. And that's really not easy because we can't bring this into the lab, which means that what we lose is scientific control. When I study physics, and when I study chemistry, I can bring those things into the lab, control all of my different circumstances, and then try to figure out something very specific. When I want to figure out the patterns in nature, let's face it, humanity probably had a better handle on those things way before science came around. But that's not to say that science doesn't have an important role today. There's a lot of patterns that we can find using the scientific method, even in a system as complicated as this, that we can't bring into the lab. Uh, so let's have a look at some of those patterns. So the first thing a scientist needs to figure out is if I can't bring nature into the lab, where's my lab? And while well, you're looking at it, we call this place an ecosystem and an ecosystem is the combination of all of the living and the non-living things in an area so here you can see a nice big ecosystem and it's the combination of uh, the water and the air and the dirt uh, the rocks all of those things are what we call the abiotic or non-living factors in this ecosystem and then there's all these living things around me too that are part of that system. We've got the trees, we've got the birds, we've got the grass, we've got the clovers. Uh, there's so much life that makes up part of this ecosystem as well. And what an ecologist is trying to do is to study the patterns of the interactions between the non-living and the living things. How do they interact with each other? Look at how many different species live in just one little spot of the forest floor. A scientist could spend their whole life studying just one tiny region and they'd never run out of new things to discover. So this ecosystem is big and complex and you can see this particular one is even within a city but you might look down over here where brenda is sitting and think that she's just sitting on a rock but hey brenda what is that right in front of you lichen, lichen. so even on the surface of this very rock is a complex community of living things we've got a few different species of lichen and I'm sure that beyond what you can see with just the naked eye, there's bacteria, maybe some viruses, and other microbes that are all interacting just on the surface of this one simple rock. So what might look like the surface of the moon can actually be an incredibly interesting place for an ecologist to study life. We can study ecology from the scale of whole forests, or our ecosystem might be as tiny as the head of a pin. Oh, hey, I see another ecosystem. It's inside of you. So that's right, even inside of you is a whole ecosystem of complex living things. There's all kinds of microbes that live inside and on your body that help you to do your life processes. So ecology is really happening everywhere and it's one of the most fascinating things about this planet that you could possibly study. Hey Lizzie, yeah. how does it make you feel to be in nature? Good. Yeah, you like it? Brenda, what do you think? Oh, it's the best place I've ever been. Oh, and Daddy. What did you find? A wormy. Whoa, another one? Aw. Look at it, it's so cute. You having fun? Yeah. I'm just gonna put it back. Good, I see robins. Whoa, check out this ecosystem, guys. Hey girls, what's this? You got it. What about these guys over here? Dandelion! Yeah, you're right. There's so many different species all in just this one tiny space. And you're right, Lizzie. This is a little grassland. 
So never underestimate the power of looking in your own backyard. Hey girls, what do you got there? Lizzie, what Worms. do you have? Whoa, so beautiful. And hey Brenda, what did you find? Some um, millipedes. Oh, don't drop them. I found those. It's okay, let's look at the one right you got. Here. You got him? Where is he? Mommy, there he is. He is so silly. Let's see the one in your hand here. It's sticking on to me. So beauty. Yeah. Hey Lizzie, Nail's what's right. that? A snail shell. Oh my gosh, what happened to it, do you think? A bird pecked it out. Hey girls, what do you think happened to all these leaves? Why do they have perfect circle holes in them? Because it's raspberries! No, it's not from the raspberry plants all around us. Hair! What do you think? Animals, Hair. insects! It must have been insects that took little bites out of them, right? So, no matter which ecosystem you go to, one of the patterns that you can use science to try to explain is what we call the feeding relationships. We can try to track who eats who. And what's fascinating about it is that no matter where you go on Earth and no matter which ecosystem you study, that pattern of who eats who leads to the exact same place. In every ecosystem around the world, we can trace those feeding relationships back to energy that's getting captured by that thing right over there, the sun. Photosynthesis. A... Oh, hey girls. What are you, uh, what are you eating? An apple? Where did that come from? Nature. What do you mean nature? nature. Sugar. It's got sugar in it? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Wait, I mean, are you... Oh my gosh, Lizzie, don't drop your apple. So wait, does that thing... It's like a plant? Yeah. Wait, what? Let me see that thing. That's a plant. And that came from like a tree? Well, where did the sugar come from? So wait, what's how does a leaf make sugar? Photosynthesis. Photosynthesis. <laughs> and then you eat it, and you get the sugar. Yeah, and then they're sweet, sugary girls, and we turn into grains of sugar, and we never mm -hmm. stop eating sugar because we're made out of sugar, so we can just eat ourselves. Cause yeah. <laughs> Uh, hey girls, are you you all done your apple? Yeah. Yeah, was it good? Yeah. So is that all you guys ever eat is just plants? No. no. You eat meat like chicken and cow and beef pork. and pork. pork. So what? Hold on a minute. But, hold, but then what do they what do they eat? Where do they get their energy from? Plants and you're a plant. So the animals yeah. eat the plants and then you can eat the animals. So let's use this robin here as an example. So when I look at this robin, I know that what he's doing is looking for food. When you ask yourself, what's he eating? It becomes clear that he's digging in the ground for worms. And then he got asked the question, well, what's the worm eating? And the worms are actually feeding on all of the roots and dead leaves from this grass. And then when you ask yourself, well, what's the grass eating? Suddenly, the entire picture becomes clear. The grass is the end of this chain of creatures. The grass is making its own food by the process of photosynthesis. It's taking energy from the sun, water from the ground, and carbon dioxide from the air, all three abiotic non-living factors, and it's turning it into sugar, which then it builds its body out of. And if this robin is lucky, it can get some of those sugars that ended up in the soil. So that's right. These little grass plants all day long are making sugars. And they build their bodies out of it. And you and me can try to steal those sugars by eating their flesh, vegetables. 
and any meat you've ever eaten is probably a herbivore. So think of a cow. What does it do all day long? Well, it eats the grass. So in reality, sugars move from plants into animals, and then they can move from one animal to another. And these feeding relationships are called a food chain. All of these plants around me, we call them the primary producers in a food chain. And what they're producing is sugar. All of the other creatures in this food chain would be called consumers. And what are they consuming? Well, they're also consuming those sugars. And eventually you can get this complicated network of interacting species that are all linked to these primary producers. So each specific organism serves its own specific role in nature. They eat their particular kinds of foods, they're eaten by their particular kinds of predators, and ultimately they're involved in the cycling of nutrients in that ecosystem in one particular way. We call this role their niche, and the more different species we have in an area, the more complex that network of species becomes. While it may be convenient to think about feeding relationships as food chains, in reality in a forest, it's more like a complex food web. And while these food webs might represent a more realistic representation of feeding relationships in nature, it makes it really hard to study. So in ecology, we use both food chains and food webs to try to understand what's happening outside. So every creature in a food web is either making its own food, we call those autotrophs, or they're consumers, meaning that they eat sugars from some other creature, we call those heterotrophs. But there's a catch. You see, when one organism eats another, they can't get 100% of the energy that that creature captured from its food. And so in ecology, we would call each level of a food chain a trophic level. And when you move from one trophic level to the next through a feeding relationship, in reality, only about 10% of the energy from one feeding level is available to the next higher level. So what's happening to all the rest of the energy? Well, each creature is using most of that energy for itself by breaking apart those sugars, and a lot of that energy is being lost to the environment as heat. And so here is the basic structure of nature revealed. All of that complexity of that food web can be simplified by arranging these creatures into a kind of food pyramid. At the bottom of the pyramid are the primary producers that are trapping the sun's energy into sugars. And as we move up that pyramid from one trophic level to the next, less and less energy becomes available to the next higher creature. And in this way, it starts to explain what we see outside. When you go for a walk in a forest, you're going to see a lot of biomass in the form of plants but you'll see fewer animals and you'll see even fewer top predators. And that's because it takes a lot, a lot, a lot of primary production of sugar at the bottom of the food chain to support a large population of predators at the top. Understanding this pattern can have real implications for your everyday decisions. Take for example, the decision of what to eat. Let's say that we grew 100 kilograms of grain let's call it corn, and we fed all of it directly to humans. Well, only about 10% of the energy from that grain would be available to the next higher trophic level, in this case, humans. 
let's say that instead we decided to feed all of that grain to cows. And then we wanted to eat the cow. Well, only 10% of the energy from the grains would be available to the cow. And then only about 10% of that energy left over would be available to us. So the longer the food chain, the less energy we have available to us at the top. It's not to say that cows don't serve very important ecological roles potentially in a grassland ecosystem. It's just to say that it takes a lot more energy and land to produce meat than it would to produce vegetables directly. So here we are back in the city and it's really easy to forget that this too is an ecosystem. And even though it doesn't look like it or feel like it, every single thing in this city comes from nature. So the rocks and the bricks to build these buildings, their wooden foundation comes from trees. The metal was mined from the ground to make these cars. The gasoline inside of them was dug up from the earth. The food in this restaurant comes from a farm. And so we are interacting with nature in an ecosystem on a daily basis. And one of the questions that we need to start asking ourselves is how can we live in a way that depletes the earth less? There's no way that we can live without taking from nature at all. So the question becomes, how can we meet our needs today without compromising the needs of tomorrow? And that's the concept that we call sustainability meeting the needs of today without compromising the needs of tomorrow. So in the name of creating all of this, we have transformed the surface of the earth. And we need to start thinking of ways that we can still have all of the stuff that we need, but maybe make it and extract it from the earth in ways that deplete less, or better yet, what if we could get our food from places that actually rehabilitate and restore nature by understanding the ecology better rather than getting our food from places that deplete? And for example, that butcher shop right over there sources all of their meat from local farms that are taking care of their soil and taking care of their animals in ways that actually make that farm healthier every year instead of depleting it. What if the farmers of tomorrow were actually ecologists? And so the power really is yours. How much do you love nature? And how much are you willing to learn about its patterns and have those lessons influence your daily life choices and the lifestyle that you choose to live? Will your generation continue to allow the Earth's resources to deplete? Or will you be the generation that starts to restore and repair the damage of those that came before you while leading a lifestyle that's healthier and maybe ultimately a little bit happier too? Day on Earth. I love. Is this that a real one? Yeah, that's a real turtle.